All right, what are people saying in the comments today? No, dude, they gotta be trolling. They gotta be trolling. There's a lot of hype around these Kissing Booth movies. I don't know why. The first Ghost Rider movie was original and good. Review Kissing Booth 3, please. It's so bad. Not doing it. I'm not doing it. No! I refuse! I'm not doing it! Ha! <laughs> all of those people, all of those kids, they thought I was going to actually make another video on a kissing booth movie. Then again, it is what the people want. Just, just do it. Just do it. How hard can it be? It's just a movie. It's just a movie. We got this. Let's go. Come on. It's only, what, two hours long? Shit! Come on, dude. We got this. We got this. Give the people what they want. It can't be that bad. I mean, the other two were abysmal. But let's let's just let's just give it a shot. Who knows? Who knows? Well, after graduation, no one. Thank you so much to Helix for sponsoring this video. There's only one thing worse than watching The Kissing Booth 3. It's falling asleep in a chair. So thank God I have an amazing bed to fall asleep in. Like most people, sleep is really important to me. So I was super excited to partner with Helix for this video. Before owning a Helix mattress, I used to lay in bed sleepless staring at my phone for hours. But now, as soon as I hit the mattress, boom, I'm asleep. Instantly. Helix Sleep makes premium mattresses and bedding that are customized to fit your needs and conveniently ships right to your door. Everybody's different and Helix knows that. So they made a sleep quiz that matches your unique body type and sleep preferences so you can find the perfect mattress for you. I took their quiz and since I'm a side sleeper, the best mattress for me was the Helix Moonlight Lux. If you sleep with a partner, you can take the sleep quiz together and find something that's perfect for the both of you. I've had my Helix mattress for about a month now and I absolutely love it. It was incredibly easy to set up and if it makes you nervous to buy something that you haven't tried, Helix has a 100 night sleep trial so you can get more than three months to make sure that you love it. If you don't, they'll pick it up for you and you'll get a full refund. Plus, Helix Mattress has a 10-year warranty, and they even offer financing options and flexible payment plans, so a great night's sleep is never far away. Right now, they have a special financing offer where with a qualifying purchase, you could pay as little as a dollar a day for your own Helix Mattress. This is a limited time offer, and it ends on September 19th. So if you've been wanting to upgrade your sleep, now is a great time to do it. I love my Helix Mattress, and so does my dog, and I think you would love one too. If you're looking for a new bed, check out Helix. You can click the link below or go to helixsleep.com slash Elvis the Alien and get up to $200 off your Helix mattress. Thank you so much to Helix for sponsoring this video and making my sleep a hundred times better. I really appreciate it. Now back to the review. <laughs> no! Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Ah! Okay, attempt number two. Let's go. I got it this time. I got it this time. I just have to stay awake for how long is this movie? Almost two hours. Great. I got this. I got this. Come on. Come on. All right. Well, after graduation, Noel, Lee, Rachel, and I decided to take one week. Okay, I got this. Did. So? Where are you? So guys, I did it. I finally finished The Kissing Booth 3. After days of struggling to watch it in 10 minute increments, it's done. This movie starts just like the first two. Elle recaps all the activities that she, Noah, Lee, and Rachel occupy themselves with since the second movie ended. It's all a bunch of pointless detail. So the big conflict in this movie, if a person with a normal functioning brain would even describe it as a conflict, is Elle not knowing which college to attend because she was accepted at both Harvard and Berkeley. Both very nice schools. So it's kind of silly, right? Like she doesn't care about the courses she'd be taking. She doesn't care about the school itself or what it would mean for her future. All she cares about is the fact that her best friend is going to one school and her boyfriend is going to the other. And she's not sure which one to go to because all college is, is just hanging out with someone that you like all the time. So the big question, should she follow her boyfriend Noah to Harvard or should she go to Berkeley with Lee? 
Or maybe she should go to a school that will benefit her future because that's a lot of money to throw away on a school just to hang out with someone that you like. <laughs> now, I know a lot of people going to college don't really know what they want to do with their lives. So they go for like a basic business degree or something like that. In that case, that'd be fine. But she doesn't even think about what she wants to do. Not once. She doesn't mention it once. She has to have other characters in the movie do it for her. So weird. It's like she thinks college is just a big party. I know a lot of people do think that way and they end up flunking out. And Wasting a lot of money. Of course, Elle doesn't even consider her future until the end of the movie. Why are we still here? So the Flynn's are selling their beach house, and it's a place they all used to spend a lot of time. There's a montage of them having fun. <laughs> So they convince their parents to let them look after the beach house for one last summer before they sell it. Elle then finds a secret beach house bucket list that she wrote with Lee when they were younger. It's hidden for some reason. Why would you hide this? It's not like a treasure map or anything. It's just a list of like activities. Why would you want to hide this from your parents? I guess maybe they would want to hide it from Noah because they kind of harassed Noah on this list. There's a part where they like pour ice cream all over him and then they give him a wedgie. So maybe they were hiding it from him. Still kind of weird. Initially, Elle decides that she wants to attend Harvard with her boyfriend, Noah. When Lee finds out about this, he freaks out like a little baby. Remember how immature and childish he was in the last two movies? Nothing changes here. He's the same character. No growth, no development. Of course there wasn't. This is the kissing booth we're talking about. He then brings up rule 19. It's very important because these are rules that they created when they were like little little kids. Why are they still referencing these rules? It's so dumb. Grow up. So yeah, rule 19 is that besties must go to the same college. It makes no sense. Neither him nor Al think about what a college means for your future. They're just like, oh, it's just a place to go with your friends and spend thousands of dollars. So Al has to calm Lee down somehow because he's a big whiny baby. So in order to do this, she promises him that they will fulfill their entire beach bucket list this summer. Like they will do all the activities together. Because Lee can't come to terms with the fact that he won't always be attached by the hip with Elle. I think all the main characters in these movies are super childish and very immature, which makes them hard to watch. First, they had their list of rules that they had to abide by, and now they have their beach bucket list. What is with these two and their weird, like, religious bond that they have with these baby documents? <laughs> I guess they both have the mind of a child still, so it makes perfect sense that they would want to do the stuff on these lists. So Noah invites some of his friends over to the beach house in order to celebrate their last summer together. And by some of his friends, I mean the entire state. Because holy shit, Noah just randomly turned into Great Gatsby when he hosted this party. Like, holy shit. So then Ellen Lee start fulfilling the activities listed on their beach bucket list. Some of which are really strange, like winning a pie eating contest and winning a sandcastle building contest. So they have to win, not just try to win. What are the odds that they just happen to win both? Unless they just did them over and over and over and over again until they won. Another thing on this beach bucket list is to give Noah a wedgie because they totally couldn't have done that when they were little kids when they created this list. And then there's stuff on the list like go skydiving. But the best one is number 22. And guess what it is, guys? It's to live together at Berkeley because that's what all kids are thinking about, what college they want to go to. That's on all their minds. Not Legos, not video games, not cartoons, but college. <laughs> Remember Marco from the second movie? Well, he pops up again. He just happened to get a job at a water park that's right next to the beach house. And then he runs into Elle because Elle's working at this restaurant that's on the beach. So that worked out nice. Remember how much tension Noah's friendship with Chloe caused in the second movie and how it almost like destroyed his relationship with Elle? Don't expect Noah to have learned from his mistakes because he hasn't at all. In fact, he spends most of his time with Chloe in this movie. He decides to call her up and he asks her if she wants to stay at the beach house. Yeah, the same beach house that Elle, Noah, and Lee and Rachel are staying at. And being sensible, Chloe's like, Hey, uh, are you sure? You should probably ask Elle about this. And then Noah goes, no, nah, it's cool. You can come. Don't worry. 
It's not like you were a massive problem for our relationship in the past. Later that night, while they're walking on the beach, Elle and Noah tell each other about Marco and Chloe. Elle is surprisingly okay with Chloe living with them at the beach house. Like, that's, that's very strange. But Noah is not okay with the fact that Elle just randomly ran into Marco. Like, she didn't ask him to move into the beach house with her. She just ran into him. And Noah's pissed off about that because I guess she asked him if he wanted to help her with some of the bucket list stuff. That's a big no-no. You can't do that. But hey, Chloe, come and live with me. That's cool. Noah goes, but at least I didn't kiss Marco. Yeah, but you prioritized her over your own girlfriend and were extremely flirtatious with her. And he also completely disregards the context of the kiss. It wasn't just like a normal kiss. It was different, but... Whatever. If it wasn't completely obvious from the previous movie, Noah is a very shitty boyfriend. Lee and Elle ask him if he wants to dress up as a Mario character and ride around in go-karts with them, which sounds amazing. I think anybody would love to do that. And he refuses? Why? Does he not like fun? What a massive killjoy this dude is. And of course, the next thing Noah does is he meets up with Chloe to hang out with her on her massive fancy yacht, because that's... Totally fine. Elle then tells Marco about the go-kart race. And Marco shows up to the race dressed up as Wario. I've been telling you guys, okay? Marco is the better guy in like every way. I don't know why she isn't with this guy. Like, it's so weird. He goes above and beyond for her in every way. And Noah is just an overprotective weirdo that doesn't like fun. So I don't... Oh my god. Of course, Noah seeing this while sitting in the stands gets salty. So he joins the race and like a big baby rams into Marco's cart, forcing him off the track, turning it into a dick measuring contest. Even after the race is done, Marco, being the better guy, actually shows some sportsmanship and walks over to Noah and offers a handshake. Bitter Noah denies him, of course. Noah then immediately hangs out with Chloe again, because of course he does. Like, why would he ever spend time with his actual girlfriend? That makes no sense. Yeah, just hang out with Chloe all the time. This next part is hilarious. So Noah sets up this nice candlelit dinner to make things right with Elle. But on the same night, Elle has a huge flash mob performance planned with Lee. So when Noah surprises Elle with the candlelit dinner, she's like, oh shit, I have this huge thing planned tonight. I'm sorry, I gotta go. I think this is more Elle's fault than Noah's, because obviously she should have told told him about this huge flash mob event. She even tells him in this scene that it took weeks for them to get this right. So she didn't mention it to him once this entire time. She didn't tell him about it the night before or the day of. This is kind of a big deal. There's a lot of people involved, including Lee and Rachel. So like, what? Why wouldn't Noah know about this? It makes no sense. Does she just not want to include him in anything? I mean, yeah, he did deny the IRL Mario Kart race, which is kind Kind of ridiculous, but still. You couldn't at least have him sit down in this restaurant and watch this cool flash mob thing take place? It's kind of a huge thing that doesn't happen every day, and she just didn't tell him about it. Why are these two even dating? Their communication sucks! And Noah is salty about the fact that she can't have dinner with him. Why on earth would he be understanding and supportive of the fact that his girlfriend has this massive flash mob thing to do tonight? Because that's what a good boyfriend would do, and he's obviously not that. <laughs> Marco then visits Elle while she's working and Noah goes surfing with Chloe. So you can see the movie is attempting to do this whole like, oh no, Elle is hanging out with Marco and Noah is hanging out with Chloe. Bad, bad. The movie is trying to convince the viewer that it's the same thing, that they're both in the wrong, but they're not though. Noah is way more guilty of being weird than Elle. Elle is just working and Marco is showing up and being like, hey, what's up? Noah is actively seeking Chloe out. Like they hang out on a yacht, they go surfing together, they play pool in one scene. Like they're just constantly hanging out. I don't think there's one scene of Elle and Marco like hanging out aside from while she's on break at work. Like that's not the same. <laughs> Chloe echoes my sentiments in this scene. Well, then do something about it. Like, talk to her or fight for her, anything. Elle then vents to Marco about Noah and her college predicament. And of course, he's very sweet with her. He then asks if he can visit her after her shift, which is kind of weird, right? Like, what are you gonna do, take her home? She's dating someone. So that's one strike against Marco, against the, like, thousand strikes against Noah. So Chloe's parents are getting divorced and she's having issues dealing with it. So she vents to Noah. And Noah cares more about helping Chloe than he does about 
about keeping his relationship with his girlfriend. It's so weird. Cringe Lord Noah then visits Elle after her work shift. He's holding a single rose and he plays a song on a jukebox. I'm surprised he didn't have the rose in his teeth. You know how the these scumbags always have the rose in their teeth? Marco shows up a little bit afterwards, finds them dancing, and he leaves. Elle calls Marco the next day to apologize about ghosting him. And of course, he's very understanding. Then there's a party being held at the beach house. Marco and Noah are facing off playing volleyball. And Noah spikes the ball into Marco's face. Wow, dick move, dude. <laughs> Marco calls him an asshole after the game. I mean... I would too. And then Noah goes up to him and he's like, hey, you don't have to be a sore loser. He's not being a sore loser. You just spiked a ball into his face and all these people were watching. I mean, come on, dude. He didn't just lose. He was humiliated. So then Noah being a big baby because he doesn't like being called an asshole. That's me. So he raises his voice and he tells all the surrounding people that Marco is just there because he's in love with Elle, which is obviously very awkward for Marco, right? And Marco's like, shut up, dude. Come on, just be quiet. But he just keeps going. So Marco punches him and says, big thing where like, oh, Marco's the bad guy. Come on, dude. Is he though? I mean, he probably should have just walked away instead of punching him, but still. So that's two strikes against Marco. A billion, like a huge pile of strikes against Noah. Who's worse? Eh? So Noah rides away on his bike after saying, I told you not to let him back into our lives to L. He's just whining some more. There's a lot of whining in this movie. And that's kind of rich coming from the guy that spends like all of his time with Chloe, the same girl that caused so many issues in their relationship before. So look in a mirror, dude. <laughs> Marco then does something very strange. He tells Elle that he loves her after this huge thing that happened and that she's not meant to be with Noah, which I agree with, but he definitely could have chose a better time to say this stuff to her. Like, goddamn, let her calm down a little first. That night, Elle is a huge bitch to her stepmom in front of the whole family. She walks out on her family and she's all upset. Her dad races after her. She then tells her dad that he's selfish for finding love. Is there a single soul in this movie that Elle does not want to start some conflict with? Doesn't seem like there is. <laughs> Like, her stepmom is a sweetheart in this entire movie, and her dad is extremely understanding. The three main characters in these movies are so infuriating to watch because none of them have any self-awareness. Lee, Noah, Elle, they're all terrible. In the next scene, Noah explains the obvious to Elle, that she should chase her passions and make her schooling worth a damn instead of chasing people. Also, he says this to her under the Hollywood sign. I think that's illegal. Arrest this man. Arrest them both, please. So Elle had plans to play this dance game with Lee, but things came up with Noah so she couldn't make it. She tries to explain this to him later that night. And of course, he bitches and whines about how she doesn't care about him. Uh, what, dude? This entire summer, she's been spending all of her time with you doing all this ridiculous shit. Like, does anything happen in here? Like, come on. Use common sense, please. If this were the case, then I think that's fair because she's dating Noah and you're not little babies anymore. But the funny thing is, I don't think this is the case. I think she likes Lee more than Noah. <laughs> Did he completely forget about the flash mob thing that she completely abandoned Noah for? She could have easily had dinner with Noah instead, but she didn't. But Lee has the memory of a goldfish, so I guess we can't blame him. It seems to me like the movie is kind of coming to a close, right? There should be like one big scene of her making amends with everybody and then the movie's over. No, there's 30 minutes left. <laughs> The entire premise of this movie is incredibly idiotic. Elle then has a conversation with Mrs. Lynn that sums up pretty well how dumb this movie is. Maybe it's time that you think about what it is that you want to do. Figure out what your dream is, what you're passionate about, and then choose a school based on that. Obviously, she should attend a school that leads to a future that she wants. The people that happen to go to that school should be a bonus. They should never be the reason for attending. Figure out what you want to do with your life first, and then go to college. Don't don't waste all that money going to a college just because you want to be with a certain person. That's ridiculous. But Elle is too stupid to know this until people spell it out for her. She needed an entire summer to learn this very simple lesson. The rest of the movie is just Elle tying up loose ends with the other characters. It's very, very boring. And of course, she doesn't go to Harvard or Berkeley. She ends up going to USC for game design because I guess she loves video games. I mean, yeah, she plays a fighting game like once or twice in this movie, but there was never like any scenes that made me think like, oh, this girl loves video games. So that was kind of random. Also, the kissing booth shows up randomly at the end. It's just like, hey, this is the kissing booth. It's still going on for some reason. They're still doing this? this creepy, creepy kissing booth where people can sexually assault people. Yep, it's still happening. That's good news. Oh, and her hair gets shorter at the end. Like she has short hair now. Cool. That's it. 
That's the Kissing Booth 3. Overall, it's not as bad as the first two, but it's definitely still bad. I can't believe I watched it. Wow, what a waste of time. Thanks guys, appreciate it. <laughs> Please let me know if there's a movie that you'd like me to review in the comment section down below. If you like the shirt I'm wearing or the hat that I'm wearing, you can get them at alienclothing.com. And thank you so much to all my patrons. I love you guys so much and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye. <laughs>